Welcome to the Open Forum, a telephone talk program designed to give you the opportunity to ask questions and discuss issues related to the Bible. Our host is Harold Camping of Family Stations Incorporated. The phone number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When you call, allow the phone to keep ringing. Your call will be answered when it is time for you to be on the air. When your call is taken, please be ready to turn your volume down. Our phone number is 1-800-322-5385. Now we present Open Forum with our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. The privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is God's book to the human race. The Bible, therefore, is the most unique book in the, on the face of the earth. There is no other book like it. It is written by God, Almighty God, who created the universe himself. He is the author. Holy men of old spoke as God the Holy Spirit moved them, and the Holy Spirit is eternal God himself. Therefore, we are so privileged, it is such a magnificent fact that we can use this book, this magnificent book, the Bible, as the authority, as the reference book, as the resource book for this program. So that any time uh, there is a subject that is brought up, we, if possible, will relate it to the Bible, and the Bible speaks to an enormous number of subjects that uh, we humans are intensely interested in, and if we can learn something from the Bible, then we have absolute truth. There is just, uh, it's just an incredible fact that we're able to have such a book as a resource book for this program. Now, before we take our first call from our telephone lines, there we have a listener in Holland, uh, the Netherlands, who is uh, actually an Iraqi. He writes in the Arabic language, and this has been translated into our language. And uh, one question that he raises is, I am one of the sinners. What do I do to become saved? You are going to tell me, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. My question is, are words enough? Well, you know, that's exactly the question that the jailer of Philippi asked the Apostle Paul. Sirs, what must I do to become saved? And the answer was, exactly as this uh, Iraqi individual has, has expected, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now comes the big question. How does that all work out? Tell me, what is the mechanism? How, how can I begin to believe? We have to search the Bible to get more information. The Bible is its own interpreter. And to our utter dismay, we find, at least at first we are dismayed, we find that uh, we begin as those who are in complete rebellion against God. Romans 3 says, There is none that seeketh after God. No, not one. More than that, the Bible tells us we're dead. God uses a, a, the figure of a valley of dry bones. And if you can uh, tell of a valley of dry bones, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus. And if you expect any reaction from them, then you are out of your mind because no valley of dry bones, no person who is that dead can begin to obey the command to believe on the Lord Jesus. And yet, that is what salvation is. It is to believe on the Lord Jesus, to have placed my whole trust in him. Well, then we have an impossible situation. Uh, if I am as dead as dry bones, uh, and God is commanding me I have to believe, it means it's impossible. It's impossible for me to become saved. 
that is true. From my vantage point, it is impossible that I could ever become saved by any action that I would take. You see, the fact is, as we continue to read the Bible, we find that God says, for example, in John 6, verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father draw him. Oh, I see. Well, the Father is eternal God. And so if God himself will begin to do something in my life, that's where it has to start from, with God. I am, I can't even hear the command with my spiritual ears, believe on the Lord. I certainly cannot obey it. I am like dry bones. There is no life within me. But God can give me life, if that's his good pleasure. And as a matter of fact, when I search the Bible, I find that it is God's good pleasure to save a great multitude for himself. Uh, and these are the ones that he chose already before the foundation of the earth, that they should become saved. Now, did he choose them because he saw that somewhere along the line they would have a want to become saved? The answer is no. No, there's no one who of themselves wants to become saved on God's terms. Oh, yes, we all want to get right with God, but we want to get right with God on our own program, on our own terms. We're not ready to accept the fact of the truth that the Bible tells us about, namely that we're dead, dead as dry bones, and there's nothing we can do. But that is where it all begins. We are, we have to wait upon the Lord to make us believe. He has to enter into our dry bones and give us life. And when he gives us life, it means he's already saved us. And then, uh, because he saved us, he's given us spiritual ears so that we I uh, have an intense desire to want to do the will of God. And when he saves us, it means that he has given us a new resurrected soul. Our dead spiritual soul has been replaced by a soul that has eternal life. But God has to do it. Now, as I've said very, very frequently, uh, we know that the environment in which he saves is in the environment of the Bible, and a second environmental uh, situation must prevail in our day, and it's an unusual environment. It was not true 20 years ago, or for the last 1900 years, uh, the environment would have been uh, if we were uh, in a church somewhere. That was a good place to be in an environment where God might apply the word of God to our hearts and save us. But today, no, not in the church. The Holy Spirit is not working there. We have to be outside of the church, and we have to be under the hearing of the word. Now, we can be outside of the church and under the hearing of the word, and it doesn't mean God is going to save us. These are not conditions that, uh, that assist us in getting saved. These are simply the environment in which God will save if it is his good pleasure to save us. So, we're outside of the church, we're reading the Bible. We want to be in that environment. And if it's God's good pleasure to save us, he will save us. He is sovereign in this. But we can do one more thing. Oh my, I'm so, so concerned about my salvation. Oh, I wonder if God is paying attention to me at all. Uh, I know that uh, he knows everything, but oh my, I wish I could get a message to him. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can get a message to eternal God of your desire. You can cry out to him, and God wants you to cry out to him, to beseech him, to beg of him, to implore him, to, to uh, come crawling uh, to him. Oh, God, have mercy, have mercy. I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to hell. Have mercy. And uh, who knows? Maybe I'm one of the ones that God has planned to save. That's God's business altogether. 
but I know that because I can cry out to him, at least I know he knows about me. I have that assurance in my soul, and at the same time, I know that I'm in an environment where he can save, if that is his good pleasure, but I can't do anything to get myself saved. God has to do the whole work of salvation. And we don't, we don't become impatient with God. There are those who have, have, uh, prayed and prayed and prayed and oh, they, nothing happens. And so they say, well, maybe I'm not one of God's elect. Maybe I'm not one of God's elect. So what's the use of praying? I better get on with my life and enjoy as much of this world as possible. Well, that isn't the way it is. Uh, if you uh, if you have decided you're not one of God's elect, you are claiming you know more than God. Because we don't know, you don't know whether you're one of God's elect or not. Only God knows that. And he commands us to, to, uh, to uh, uh, come unashamedly to him and boldly to him, crying to him for mercy. And so... And to wait upon him. And so you keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. A week goes by, a month goes by, a year goes by. You keep praying, beseeching the Lord and, and reading your Bible. And maybe, maybe, maybe God may have mercy. But if he doesn't have mercy, you're going to be in terrible trouble. You're going to go to hell. And, uh, and you don't want to. And at least... You want to try to stay in an environment where God might save you if that's his good pleasure. Well, thank you, uh, um, our Iraqi uh, listener, for your good question. And shall we go to our first caller from our telephone lines? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Mr. Camping. Yes. Could I ask you a question? Why did Jesus Christ, our heavenly king, leave his heavenly throne and come down to this earth and suffer the most terrible suffering that any man could suffer. Why, Why did, did he, he do, do that? that? Because, you see, he came to claim a people for himself. God gave certain humans to Christ. All, Jesus says, all that the Father giveth me will come to me. But unfortunately, all those humans that were given to Christ by the Father are dripping with guilt. They have sins. And the law of God declares that they have to be punished eternally, for, eternally in hell as payment for their sins. So uh, uh, they are given to Christ, but he can't have them because they have to go to hell to pay for their sins. The only way he can have them for his own is if he himself would take the punishment for them. And that's exactly what Christ did. All these that were given to him by the Father, they, their sins were laid upon the Lord Jesus. So he became guilty with an enormous load of sin. And then God had to cause him to bear the punishment in the, as a stand-in or as a substitute for these that Christ has claimed for himself. And, uh, and so that was the awful wrath of God he had to endure in order to be our Savior. And because he successfully paid for all those sins, now he can forgive these individuals their sins, and they can go right into God's holy heaven uh, because he has uh, he has made the payment and and he uh, because the payment was made he can the whole God the Holy Spirit can complete the task of making them new creatures in Christ giving them right now a new resurrected soul and on the last day a brand new resurrected body and so the those that were given to him by the Father will be Christ forevermore in the future. But he said he came that all men should be saved, not just a few. And it's up to us to accept his suffering, his dying. That is our choice. Oh, well, excuse we me. To... No, excuse me. Now, if Jesus had paid for, let's, let's name some wicked person that you can remember. Let's say Hitler. He murdered a lot of people. There's no evidence he died saved. 
Well, now, if he, Christ paid for the sins of all men, he paid for Hitler's sins. Now, if, the sin, if all of his sins have been paid for so that the righteous justice of God has been satisfied, then how can God send Hitler to hell? His sins have all been paid for. Why uh, then? Then Hitler uh, cannot be sent to hell because uh, Hitler is going to stand at the judgment throne, and every unsaved person is, and and have to answer for all the deeds they've ever done, and they're going to be judged by by all the sins that God finds there. Well, now if they, those sins have already been paid for, how can God do that? That would be an injustice of the worst kind. He chose the way of Baal. He didn't. Cho cho he didn't choose God. That well, well, excuse me. It isn't a matter what, whether he did or not. The fact is, if he stands guiltless before God, if his sins have been paid for, he has no guilt any longer. And how could a, a an honest God send a, a sinless person to hell, whether he chose God or not? How can he send him to hell if he has no sins? He wasn't innocent. Christ paid for his sins, but he chose to to go in and to go into sin, and he chose the way well, of the devil. And well, excuse me. Uh, 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 any any sin when Christ paid for somebody's sins, how many sins did he pay for for that person? How many sins did he pay for? All for? of them. All, all right. Them. So also. If that person rejects Christ, that's a sin. Well, then he goes to hell. Well, but then, but how can he? How can he go to hell when that sin has been paid for? Because he rejected Christ. Well, excuse me, that's a sin. And if Christ paid for all of his sins, he would have paid for the sin of rejecting Christ. And so that you go to hell because you have to pay the penalty for your sin. But if you have no longer any sins then God can't send you to hell. That would be a terrible injustice. Well, when you, when, he, when you are first born, you're born into this world a sinner. And then you have to either receive Christ or reject him. Well, excuse me. But he me. has already paid for your sins. Now, it's up, now you have that choice. You well, have that choice. Well, excuse me. That's what men say. But the fact is... What if you reject Christ? That's sin. But if Christ paid for a person, all of a person's sin, then that sin too was paid for. You go to hell as payment for sin. And if you have no sin, God, a holy, righteous God, cannot send someone to hell. But the fact is, they're not going to hell because they reject Christ. They're going to hell because they have a whole lot of sin. That's why we read in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And it says there, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. In other words, if Hitler stands there, he's not going to be guilty of rejecting Christ. He's going to be guilty of, of, a, of a million sins that he's committed. He has to pay for all those sins. And, and, and he has to pay for those sins because Christ has not paid for those sins. If Christ paid for somebody's sins, then God cannot send that person to hell. That is the, the idea that Christ paid for everybody's sins is not the Bible's teaching at all. That's man's teaching. That's what men have concocted out of their, out of their minds. Uh, uh, because that sets the stage for the next wrong teaching that now we can reach out and accept that Christ. But the fact is that, that uh, uh, Christ only paid for the sins of those that he planned to save. Uh, we, we read, for example, in Revelation chapter 13, in Revelation 13, there God says, in uh, in uh, mm, 
in verse uh, 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that is, worshiping the beast, that's Satan, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Their names aren't written there. They never were written there. And on the other hand, in Ephesians chapter 1, God says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. He hath chosen us, that is, he elected certain ones before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, these are the ones that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the ones that he chose. And, and these are the ones that he saves. That's why Jesus said in John 6, verse 37, All that the Father giveth me will come to me. And he said in, and in Matthew 1, the angel told uh, uh, Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Who are his people? All that the Father giveth me. In other words, that whole doctrine, that whole teaching of universal atonement that Christ paid for the sins of everyone has no biblical basis. It's out of the mind of men. It is the kind of a, a teaching that is reprehensible to God. It's really blaspheming what God has set forth. Well, we have to accept him. And if we don't accept him, then we go to hell. Well, we, excuse me, but how can a dead man accept him? If but we how are can we be dead when Christ gave us life when he died for us? He, he, that's, when we be, that's when we become alive. We, we are alive through Christ Jesus, through yeah, his well, blood. Ex excuse me. Uh, you, uh, you, what, are you, what are you going to do with, with Romans 3, verse 10? There is none that seeketh after him, no, not one. Now, how do you answer that? There's none that seeketh after him. No, not one. And you can't answer it by what your church says. You have to answer it by the Bible. The Bible says very clearly, there is none that seeketh after him. No, not one. If I read Ephesians 2, it describes someone who did become saved. And in verse 1 it says, where in, in, verse, uh, in, uh, in verse 2, or no, verse 1, And you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, if we're dead, how much life is within us? None. None. Now, it goes on to describe this. Wherein in time past... Now, remember, I'm reading the Bible. I'm not reading a church confession. I'm not reading what my church believes or somebody else's church believes I'm reading what God is saying these are God's words and therefore they are absolutely true and trustworthy where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conduct in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, he's talking about someone who did become saved, and he's describing, God is describing, how dead we were before we became saved. We were we were under the rule of Satan, and we were, we were uh, 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 by nature, the children of wrath. And then it describes how we got saved. And it says nothing at all about accepting Christ. It says in verse 4, the next verse, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath made us alive, Notice how God is rubbing that in. We're dead. He had to make us alive. We're dead. Uh, uh, he hath made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye have been saved and hath been raised up together. Uh, you see, a grace is the gift of, of God that, that uh, he did all the work in getting us saved. 
And that means that this whole idea of a do-it-yourself gospel where we reach out and accept him has no biblical validation. And I'm so glad we're able to talk about this together because I worry about all the people who think they're saved because they accepted Christ. Well, when did they become born again? When did they receive a brand new resurrected soul? And how, how do they know whether all of their sins have been paid for? Because Christ only paid for the ones that he planned to save. And so I'm afraid that at Judgment Day there are going to be millions of people lined up saying, Lord, Lord, just like we read in Matthew 7, we did many mighty things, mighty works in your name. We prophesied in your name. And the Lord will say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me that work, work iniquity. And so now is the time to face this awful truth. That, uh, and, and it's imperative that we face it. Did Christ save me or did I get myself saved? Do I, do I, am I reading the Bible correctly or am I listening to my church and I've ended up with a gospel where, where it's man-made, we're just actually trying to join up with Christ and, and maybe Christ hasn't paid for my sins at all. Well, I, let me tell you, I don't go to church, Mr. Camping, but I read the Bible and I know that the Lord in His Word says that we, that you just read that scripture, that's exactly what I've been trying to tell you. We were dead in trespasses and sin until we accepted Jesus Christ and His dying and His well, suffering Well, excuse on the me, the Bible says none that you're not, you say you're listening to the Bible, but you're not listening to the Bible. You claim you're listening to the Bible. You'd like to claim you're listening to the Bible. But then test it. Test it. This is what the Bible says in verse 10 of Romans 3. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. Now, you read the Bible. That's what that's, that's God saying. What does he mean by that? If you're going to say you read the Bible... Well, then, all right, then read this, read this, and think about this. There's none that seeketh after God, no, not one. So how are you going to get around that one? You've got to listen to what the Bible says, not what your m mind has taught you or what somebody else has taught you. And, and incidentally, the position you hold is, is widely held in church after church after church. You're not, you didn't come up to this all by yourself out of the Bible. That's widely held all, everywhere. But it is, it is unfortunately a salvation program that will, is not bringing salvation. It's a man-made idea that is not based on the scriptures. But thank you for calling and sharing. Weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. In Job 41.11, the Lord asks Job, who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Yes, everything that is under heaven belongs to our God. So why is it that we should bring him offerings? Well, it's because he chooses to use the offerings of his people for our own good. It's a blessing to our souls to give him the honor, worship, glory, and praise that is due his name. In short, it's a privilege to give a little bit back to him in thanks for the many and great blessings that he has showered on us. Perhaps you would like to offer him a gift through this listener-supported ministry. Write and help us this month. Write Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. <laughs> We continue with more of the Open Forum. 
You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping. Yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, you're truly saved, right? Pardon? You believe that you are truly saved? I believe I am saved, yes, by God's mercy. It's something I absolutely don't deserve, and I don't understand why God bothered to save me. But I do find the evidence in my life, I believe, that I truly am a child of God. Okay. May I ask, uh, slowly please, to give us a scripture that assures your salvation, personally. The Bible, first of all, says in Romans 8 that God's Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are sons of God. Now, how does the Bible witness? Or how does the Holy Spirit witness? The Bible says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And so as if, if there's going to be a witness, it has to come from the Word of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, God says, If we say we know Him, and in that context, uh, to say we know Him means that we have become a child of God. Uh, if we say we know him, we will keep his commandments. Now, what are his commandments? The whole Bible. In other words, in the life of the true believer, there is an earnest, ongoing desire to do the will of God. He is. We're only happy when we're doing the will of God. Or to say it the other way, if we begin to move towards sin, there is unhappiness and difficulty in our life because we we are we are. Uh, uh, the Bible says that when we become saved, we receive a new resurrected soul in which we never want to sin again. And uh, that's why he can say, if, uh, if we say we know him, we will keep his commandments. In our new resurrected soul, which is an integral part of our personality, we have an intense desire to do the will of God that translates into actually doing the will of God. A real desire to walk very humbly, a real desire to recognize that is anything good in me is only because of God's mercy. I don't deserve anything. A real desire to make sure that every doctrine I hold will be as faithful to the Word of God as possible. Okay, and I truly can understand that, but and, and the verses that I'm looking for from you is are the verses that you use to um, assure your salvation. I mean, honestly, you know that you cannot keep every commandment of the Lord. I cannot. No man can. Well, but you see, as I indicated, the, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And as we read the Bible... And we find that we, we are, first of all, we're unafraid to look at each, anything and everything. We can look at hell right in the, in the eye. We can look at the wrath of God right in the eye. In other words, we, we, the whole word of God is, is, uh, is, uh, we want to understand everything that we can about anything and everything. And, uh, and, uh, you, uh, and when you find that you have a real love for the Word of God and desire the Word of God, these are the kind of evidences that God gives us. And, uh, and if you're not saved, you can't understand this, of course. If you're not saved, of course you can't understand it because you've never had that kind of an experience. Point then I can accept that I am truly saved even though I still sin. Even on a daily basis, I commit sin. Well, but you see, when you say I still sin, we can use that as a catch-all phrase. But the fact is that if we find that we are 
uh, living with a besetting sin. It just stays with us and stays with us, uh, a particular sin. And uh, and we, we are not tr particularly troubled about it. After all, everybody has a little bit of sin in their life. Then we have to ask the fair question, am I really saved? Because when we're really saved, we're not happy with that besetting sin. We 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 uh, uh, we we feel troubled because in our new resurrected soul, which is an integral part of our personality, we don't want to sin. And it, and or to say it the other way, if we truly are a child of God, we can look back a few years at a time when we were sure we were saved already. And, and there ought to be progress in our life. There ought to be a growing in grace so that we have a greater desire to walk humbly before God and to uh, uh, be this, uh, a humble servant of the Lord and to do His will than we had even a few years ago. There should be a growing in grace. And, and the Bible simply says, God's Spirit witnesses with our spirit. Now, I don't know how God... God uh, uh, gives us that that gives you begins to give you that security and that settled feeling that I am a child of God. That's God's business, but I can tell you it is it it is there. It is present there. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, one more, if I may. Uh, Matthew twelve uh, thirty through thirty two uh, speaks of blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, in which I have uh, uh, through studies. Uh, come to believe that that means uh, that we're actually rejecting the Holy Spirit. We're not accepting God's uh, plan of salvation. We're not accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. If that were the case, then there would be countless people that are have crossed the line and they couldn't. There's no possibility of salvation because blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was a sin for which there was no forgiveness. Wonderfully, that is not the case. We can reject Christ a hundred times, and if we're still living and it's still the day of salvation, uh, then the, the God can still save us. Uh, he, he came to Old Testament Israel again and again. Uh, and uh, like, for example, he said in Isaiah 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his path and let him return unto the Lord for he will abundantly pardon. And that's he's saying that to people who have rejected Christ again and again. Uh, the fact is that that the, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was a very specific sin. We read in uh, Mark 3, uh, the language is almost the same as in Matthew, it's just a little bit plainer. He says in verse 22 of Mark 3, the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He, the Christ, hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. In other words, they were claiming that Christ was under the power of Satan. And then Jesus answered them and said in verse 28, All sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. And then he explained what that sin was in verse 30, the next verse. Because they said, He, that is Christ, hath an unclean spirit. Now, these scribes, uh, they were the religious rulers, and they were convinced that Christ was under the power of Satan rather than against under the power of God himself, and uh, consequently, they wanted him killed. They, the last thing they wanted, that he might be their savior. They, they, they repudiated Christ altogether. He was under the power of Satan. And Christ is simply saying, yes, and you've crossed over the line. There's no, no possibility that you'll, you'll ever become saved. I have never met an individual who has blasphemed the Holy Spirit by God's mercy. Uh, that's a very, very rare sin. But uh, I've, and I've never met anybody or talked with anybody that I believe would have committed that sin. I have uh, met many, many people that uh, just flatly reject uh, the birth and uh, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. But as long as, as long as they're living, how do you know whether they're one of the God's elect? Can God save them? Of course he can. God does the saving. They have not 
they have not come to the point where they believe that Christ was under the power of Satan so that they absolutely don't want Christ as their savior and if they had come to that point yes then they have committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit but by God God is very merciful and uh, and uh, you know uh, there are people who uh, I meet people I met uh, uh, recently, I met an individual who says, "Man, five years ago, I was such a such a vicious uh, sinner, so, and so much in rebellion against God. And then, mysteriously, I f began to find out I love the Bible, and and I'm a changed man. God just did something in my life. It is so beautiful. Thank, thank you, thank, thank you, you very for much. calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum." Oh, hello, Mr. Camping. Yeah. Uh, regarding uh, your statements about uh, concerning uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture, would you turn to Second uh, Corinthians uh, chapter three? Second uh, Corinthians chapter three. Uh, all right. Twelve. What verse? Twelve to sixteen. Twelve to sixteen. 2 Corinthians 3, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look on to the end of, which, of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to, when he shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, what is your question? St. Paul, uh, from what I gather, refuses to read uh, merely for the literal meaning, but finds... Uh, after the Christ event, a way of reading beyond the veil to the spiritual truths of the text. In other words, um, instead of uh, mo reading uh, the scriptures as Moses would have read it, uh, we have to read it in light of the incarnation. Oh, well, you, the fact is that uh, you were correct, of course. The whole Bible is the gospel. And until we find a gospel in, in any part of the Bible, we haven't found really the truth. And Christ did speak in parables. And it is true that, uh, that uh, the, the Israelites who remained saved, or uh, remained unsaved, they did not see the spiritual meaning of, uh, for example, when they, when they uh, uh, obeyed the ceremonial laws of the uh, uh, blood sacrifices and the burnt offerings and, uh, and uh, the Seventh-day Sabbath and so on, they thought that by keeping those laws they could get right with God. And they didn't look beyond that into the fact that those laws were simply pointing them to the coming Messiah, that he was the one who would have to be their burnt offering, their blood sacrifice. He was the one who had to do all the work of saving them, and and uh, but God left them in their blindness, and uh, that's that's what this uh, these verses are emphasizing. So in other words, uh, when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we really have to view it in light of the New Testament. Is that correct? We have to view it in the light of the whole Bible. We can't even understand the New Testament unless we look, read it in the light of the Old Testament. We can't understand the Old Testament unless we read it in the light of the New Testament. The Bible is one word. It is the word of God. It's one piece. And, and every part of the Bible is important. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campus. Yes. Yeah, yeah um, I hear you talking about um, um, the idea or the teaching that um, that if you're praying for salvation and reading the Bible, that um, you you still don't know if God's going to save you or not. That is correct. Because could you, the, hello. Yes. Yeah. Just could you just talk about that? Well, yeah. You see. 
God has uh, has named those whom he plans to save. Now, everybody wants to get right with God. Everyone does, because man was created in the image of God. Even the atheist who says there is no God, uh, the reason he's desperately trying to be an atheist is because he doesn't want to face the fact that he knows deep in his heart there is a God. And so he tries to get rid of that by saying there is no God. But uh, because if the minute he admits there is a God, he knows he has to answer to that God, and, and that there will be a judgment day. That's why the pagans, for example, they offered uh, sacrifices to appease the angry gods. They, they, and and in, uh, they know there's a life hereafter. The, the pharaohs, for example, who knew nothing about the Bible, they uh, buried their, their dead with, uh, art, with utensils and so on and a ship and what and servants that could be used in the life hereafter man that's ingrained in the life of man he knows there is a God he knows there's a life after death of some kind and uh, and so he's got to figure out somehow uh, how he can face that and uh, this uh, this is uh, uh, it is the Bible only the Bible that gives us the solution as to how we can face God uh, with our sins. Yeah, but I, I mean, um, this idea that you don't know if you're going to be saved when you're um, when you're, you're praying for salvation and you're reading the Bible, but you still don't know if God's going to save you. I mean, we don't know, no, because God is sovereign. He he. Uh, he uh, he has to elect us to salvation. When Jesus, for example, went to the graveyard where Lazarus was buried, uh -huh. now there were a lot of people buried there, and he he calls out one name, Lazarus, come forth. He just called out one name. He didn't say everybody come forth. He says Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb. He had been dead for four days. So uh, Christ had not only to call him, but, but he also had to, uh, to uh, qualify him to come out of that tomb. And this, now the, actually the Bible says the gospel call goes out, but only the chosen ones will hear the call and respond to the call, and they'll only do so because Christ is is in the business of saving that individual and so we, that's that's what that's what faith is is that that our trust is all together in in Christ he has to do it he has to do it all we can't do any of it well we just have to wait on him if that's his good pleasure now we need, we need to talk about waiting on the Lord um, here's here's a question um um, I'm in financial trouble, and I want I have always I wanted to finish my degree so I can um, you know earn more money. Is that what does the Bible say about that? Somebody who's really interested in salvation and reading the Bible and praying. I mean, is that a good thing to do? Knowing that money's the root of all evil and all that. Or? Well, you know the the Bible says I. I, I don't be anxious about anything. This is Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to the Lord. All right, so you pray. First of all, you pray for wisdom. You, you, are, you are troubled, you're anxious, you're, you're nervous about your situation, you're, you're, you've run out of money, you've had a, a financial setback. First of all, you pray for wisdom. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I can't do it. God, would you please give me wisdom? Secondly, oh, Lord, help me to be content. If it's your, if it's your good plan that I have to remain poor, so, so be it. So be it. Help me to be content with whatever your plan might be. Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, help me to, uh, uh, to uh, know uh, what I should do next. And, and, and I would start reading the Bible and, and, and leaning back on the Lord Jesus, leaning back on Him. And if it means that you have to uh, put off a few years before you finish your education, if it means you've got to go out and get a job right now that pays a lot less, so be it. So be it. After all... Uh, this, uh, what are you going to do with money anyway? What are you going to do with it? It's, 
Uh, you, when you die, you're not, or when Christ comes again, whatever comes first, you're not going to take any of it with you. Uh, but you want to be content in what in in your your situation, whatever it may be. You, you see, I'm. I don't think I'm saved. I mean, it, well, then and I'm the, waiting on the Lord. Well, then uh, start right out there. Oh Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. I'm a sinner, and oh Lord, have mercy on me. And uh, I. I don't know whether you're going to save me or not. I don't know if I'm one of God's elect. That's your business, Lord. But, oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy. And and uh, and I would, if I were in your shoes, I'd keep reading the Bible because that's the environment that God wants. Uh, he's going to apply the, uh, the word of God to your heart to save you. And uh, And maybe he'll save you. Maybe he won't. Maybe... He'll have you crying out to him for a long time, and then he'll save you. But that's his business. You have to leave that to him. And and but you but you can pour out your soul to him, and and uh, at least you know you 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 have his attention. But see, that's my whole point. I am praying. I am reading the Bible. So keep doing it. Well, but I'm saying, can I go to college still, or is you know well, what you you mean if you go to college you can't you can't pray anymore you can't read the bible anymore can't people save people who are going to college come you can't god save people who are going to college of course he can he can he can save us in any kind of a situation it isn't either or i i'm i'm going to cry out to god or i'm going to go to college it's both you always the the crying out to God and the reading the Bible is simply the environment in which you are living as you uh, as you try to work your way through this world. Mm. All right. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Good evening. Yeah. This is a uh, well. Anyhow, uh, I have a question. Our pastor in the pulpit. Um, Said that you said that believers should leave the church, that they shouldn't, they shouldn't belong to churches. And I thought I'd call you up and uh, find out exactly what you said, because he didn't quote or anything, so he might have been saying something that was like secondhand information or something like that. Well, this, unfortunately, that's what the Bible teaches: that the church age has come to an end. God had uh, had two. Uh, seasons for the New Testament. There was the season of the early rain that uh, brought in a Pentecostal harvest. That is, that is the Church Age. And when the work of the Church has been finished, that and that coincides with the time of the beginning of the Great Tribulation, then God says uh, we are to come out of out of the churches. We God uses the figure of the church is being called Judea or Jerusalem or Babylon. They're all synonyms for the churches that exist in our day. And we're to come out of them and we're to uh, be outside to send the gospel out. And, and after, after the, because the work of the church has been finished, God has used it for over 1900 years as the instrument to get the gospel out into the world and there have been millions of people who have become saved but but then the bible and it says that after this i saw a great multitude which no man can number that became saved and they came uh, became saved during this time of great tribulation but the but the bible but the uh, during the church age, the true believers were stones, living stones or precious stones in the temple of God. The churches were called the temple of God. But now God says that there would not be one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. And uh, that means that God no longer uh, is uh, is uh, working in the churches. It's the the true believers have either already been driven out, or as they learn about this, they will and search the scriptures. God will lay it on their hearts that they have to get out. Twenty-four, is that is, is that what's happening there? Is that the, uh, the uh, great I'm tribulation? So, I'm sorry, repeat that. 
Matthew uh, 24. 24, yes. Verse, verse 21, there will be great tribulation such as this world has never known. And then God describes the character of that tribulation in verse 24. False prophets and false Christs will arise with signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Standing in the holy place. The holy place is where the uh, gospel ordinarily would be uh, uh, offered and being used of God to save people, but now the Satan is standing there. He is ruling there. And as we read in Second Thessalonians 2, uh, he who restrains Satan is taken out, and uh, that is out of the midst, and that is the Holy Spirit who restrains Satan, and he, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the midst of the congregation. So the the there's a spirit of a, there's a famine of hearing the word of God. The word of God may still be proclaimed in that church, but there'll be no one becoming saved. How how do you know that? Uh... Because the Bible says so. Well, well, no, no, I know that, but I'm just saying, well, you know that Satan now is, is ruling, or Satan has been... Because the Bible says so. In, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, it says that Satan is seated in the temple. And the oh. temple are the churches and congregations. Well, is that and happening in, now? In Matthew 24, verse 15, it says the abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place. Both of these verses are emphasizing the same truth, that Satan is there now. And he comes, remember, he doesn't come with a forked tail and a red suit. He comes as a counterfeit Christ. He looks like Christ. He, uh, he uh, as uh, 2 Corinthians 11 emphasizes, he comes uh, uh, as an angel of light. And so those who are in the churches think that Christ is still reigning there, but the Bible gives us the real facts of the case that, no, Christ is not reigning there. Uh, Satan is reigning. No, God, the Holy Spirit, has been withdrawn from the churches. Well, these verses, and I agree with those verses, I'm just asking you, how do you know that that's happening now? Because we're in time of great tribulation. The, all over the world we see the signs and the wonders being featured. We see an enormous decay in the churches. We see people falling over backwards, and that is a uh, another sign that uh, identifies with calling down fire from heaven that we read about in Revelation 13. And we also see the, anom the strange thing of ministries like Family Radio that have wide open doors to send the true gospel all over the world. And that is the latter rain that is in the last second part of the Great Tribulation period. So these, by the time we, we find these kind of signs and these uh, actions and evidence, we know that this is the time without any question whatsoever. Was it Revelation 2021 20, talking about the two witnesses going out? Revelation 11, uh, verse, uh, but right now I have to say good night because we have come to the end of our, oh, no, no, we got another, we got another half hour, I'm sorry. Okay. Hold, okay. hold on just a minute, I'll be right back with you okay, right after you. this message. Weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. In the last chapter of the Gospel of John, when Peter had affirmed his love for Christ, he was told to feed my sheep. All those who love the Lord have a similar obligation to minister to others. The book Feed My Sheep by Harold Camping explores the scriptures to discover in detail the Christian's responsibility to the world around him. While we know we need to bring the gospel to the lost, what does it mean for us to subdue the earth in today's world? To explore this and many other related questions, ask for a free copy of Feed My Sheep by calling 
1495 that's 1-800-543-1495 or request it on the web at familyradio.com we continue with more of the open forum you are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the bible our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Canton. This is a very, very difficult uh, idea for us to accept that there would be an end of the church age. It's interesting, though, I indicated this last week on an open forum program that uh, those who hold the premillennial position, and that's a very widely taught uh, a position concerning the return of Christ, got, got one thing right, and that is they understood there would come a time when Christ would be finished with the churches. Now, they, they had it wrong as to how it would all end because they said when Christ would be finished with the churches, the, the, uh, with Christ. Well, that, that, that is incorrect because the rapture is right on the last day. But they had it right that all, that God would be finished at some point in time with the churches. And now as God has opened our spiritual eyes a little wider, we see, no, the true believers are not raptured. They're driven out of the churches, or they're commanded to come out of the churches. Uh, and, and then uh, they, the premillennial position was that this would be followed by uh, the, uh, the tribulation, the final tribulation, the great tribulation, which they thought would be seven years in duration, at which time God's judgment would be upon, uh, upon the world. And they were, and they're correct that this end of the church age did coincide with the beginning of the great tribulation and there is judgment but the judgment is upon the churches all those who remain there are under the wrath of god if they continue to remain there because uh, god is bringing ju the judgment begins with the house of god and then they also taught that at the end of the tribulation period christ would return uh, to this earth and set up a throne for a thousand years. Well, they were incorrect about the thousand years. That isn't going to happen. But they were correct that at the end of the tribulation, and it wouldn't be uh, seven years, it's typified by 70 years in the Bible, but at the end of the tribulation, Christ would return. It'll be the end of the world. And so somehow, in God's mysterious providence, the Premillennialists at least caught a faint outline of how it would go. It was so faint that they uh, that they made a lot of wrong conclusions in connected with it, that were connected with it. But they did see correctly that there would come a time when God would be finished with the church age. All the, the those believers would get out of the churches. They thought they were going to be raptured and go to heaven, but uh, they were correct that this would right at the time of the beginning of the tribulation, and they were correct in looking upon that tribulation time as a time of judgment, and that at the end of it, Christ would return. They had that all right, even though uh, mixed in it, they had a lot of wrong ideas. And now all God is doing is, because we've come right near the end of time, He's straightening out our thinking so that we're seeing the true facts of, of what uh, what God plan God's. Uh, we uh, God is doing. Tell us that we should leave the churches, or we should yeah. Um, in uh, Luke chapter. 12. 21, we read there, um, 
in, in our verse, uh, uh, Jesus is... Uh, we read that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And in that temple, he, uh, we read in 1 Corinthians 3, it's built with two kinds of building materials. There's gold, silver, and precious stones. They would be the true believers. Mm -hmm. And they all have a place in that temple. And then there is wood, hay, stubble. They are the ones who are not true believers. And they, of course, will come under hellfire on the last day. But now, uh, and, and so every believer is a precious stone, or a, in First Peter 2, he calls us living stones, mm -hmm. lively stones. Uh, we, are, uh, we are a stone in the temple of God, uh, and, and, and we all have our place. But here in Luke 21, verse 6, he says, as he looks at this temple that typified the churches and congregations, uh, uh, there, uh, the, time, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That means there will be no more stones in place in the temple, no more believers, true believers, in the churches. They'll all be thrown out or, or will have to come out. And uh, he, he says this not only in Luke 20. In, in Luke 4 teaches that there's a Jerusalem above that consists of the true believers. We are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, even though we're living out our life here on this earth. And there's a Jerusalem which is now, which consists of those who are trusting in their good works for salvation uh, and they are the unsaved in the congregation so just like there are two kinds of stones there are two kinds of Jerusalem that make up the the Jerusalem the congregations there is no other Jerusalem that it could be there it's not talking about the literal city over there alongside the Mediterranean Sea that has nothing to do with with uh, any of this kind of language, and there's no other Jerusalem in the world that it could be. It is the churches and the congregations. They are Jerusalem. And he says, when ye, in verse 20, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And uh, at the beginning of the tribulation, God indicates that Satan has been loosed and that he is marshalling all of his forces to try to conquer Christ once and for all and he's allowed to enter into the congregations and take his seat and rule there. He is the abomination of desolation that is standing there. Then it says in verse 21 of Luke 21, Then let them which are in Judea Flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of her, that is Jerusalem, depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter there into. And so there, uh, when we see Jerusalem, not when we experience, but when we see and when we look around, and you go into any city and go from church to church, and you'll find that the greatest number of them uh, by far greater, the major proportion of them are interested in signs and wonders and and uh, all kinds of things that you know they have nothing to do with the true gospel. Or, again, we can look at uh, uh, Re 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 Revelation 18, where God speaks about a Babylon, uh, the uh, harlot. And when we examine that language carefully, the only Babylon God can have in view are the churches and congregations, because he says, come out of her. True, the whole world, in a sense, is Babylon, but we can't come out of her. We are ambassadors of Christ in this world. We have to remain here. But there is a Babylon that is now particularly called Babylon because the king of Babylon is Satan, and he now is ruling in the churches. He has taken his seat in the temple. And uh, and so now that has become spiritual Babylon. 
And and right. And God says in verse four of Revelation eighteen, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Now that's plain language. If we stay there, we're going to end up under the judgment of God. Question. Uh, the rich man and Lazarus, uh, I heard a message where the fellow said that this was not a parable, that this was a real life event. And I find that difficult to believe because here we have heaven and hell and people in it and they're talking to each other. Yeah, you're correct. It's not a parable. Uh, I mean, it's not a, a historical event at all. Just if it were, it would have all kinds of contradictions. Yeah. And it is simply a parable in which God is illustrating a great number of spiritual realities that uh, that uh, come through very clearly. But it has nothing to do with a, a historical event. It would then it would be a mass of contradictions. Yeah, he said that parables don't have people's names in them. So that's a pure conclusion, a uh, pure uh, uh, just an idea from the man, That's from right. a mind of, of a theologian. Nowhere in the Bible is there a statement that a That's parable right. cannot have a man's name. Yeah, that's what I told them. I said that's contrived by man. There's no yeah. limitation on what parables can be. Right, right. Alright, thanks a lot, Mr. Gannon. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, I have a question regarding the unpardonable sin. Yes. Um, what if somebody is like a devil worshiper? Is that like selling your soul to the devil? No, no. You could be a devil worshiper. In fact, every unsaved person is a devil worshiper. Their soul is sold out to the devil because he is their master. He, he rules over them. And but Christ has come to to plunder Satan's house. When we become saved, He yanks us out of Satan's house, and we're no we're taken out of the dominion of darkness, as we read in Colossians 1:13, and we're translated into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's still hope. That's what you're saying. Absolutely, someone could be a devil worshiper all his life, and there's still hope that he might become a believer. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Very well, thank you. I was calling. Um, I've heard your um, radio program a few times before, and I'm curious to know why is it you uh, spend more time defending what sounds to be a dead religion than actually proclaiming the gospel? Uh, I'm sorry, would you repeat that, please? Yes, I was saying, I wonder why is it you've... Uh, go try again. Hello? Well, we lost that caller. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get it straight. Maybe he can try to call back. Uh, could we go to our next caller, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, could you explain Isaiah chapter 47, the I, first verse? Isaiah 47, verse 1. Let's look at that. Isaiah 47. Verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground there. There is no throne, O daughter of Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers, thy nakedness shall be, uh, uh, shall be uncovered. Now, here God is talking about the churches and congregations. This is a prophetic statement. Babylon here is are the churches and congregations during a time of great tribulation that we are in when they are are uh, 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 ruled over by Satan rather than by God and uh, they are going to be subject to the wrath of God to to uncover the thigh and cover the uh, uh, bake bare the leg and 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 thy nakedness shall be uncovered means that we're naked before God with all of our sins all of our sins 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Campy. Yes, and thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, uh, President Kerry, would you please comment on First Corinthians chapter, uh, excuse me, First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 31 and 34, and put special emphasis on dying minute by minute. Yeah, First Corinthians 15, verse 31 and 34. I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now you see, in this chapter... God is discussing through the Apostle Paul the fact that there is a resurrection of our bodies on the last day if we are true believers. And if there were no resurrection, then why not eat, drink, and be merry? What, what good is it to try to live the Christian life, uh, to fight the beasts of Ephesus? Uh, is, uh, is some were thrown into the arena uh, for the sake of Christ? And, and why not just deny Christ? Why not keep my life? Why do I have to suffer like this? But the fact is the, that I'm ready to die daily. In other words, I'm, I deny myself again and again because I'm looking for a wonderful resurrection of my body on the last day. I'm looking for the fact that I know also that when I die in my soul existence where I've already experienced the resurrection, I'm going to live and reign with Christ in heaven. Yes, uh uh, I heard some say to die hourly, but I heard some say you should die every minute, every minute, all the time. Well, uh, we, 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 uh, w when we become saved, and the Apostle Paul is talking about someone who has become saved, he has eternal life in his soul, and he's living in a dead body. But what he means here that he is, it has to mean that he's ready to die physically for the sake of Christ and no matter what comes along he denies himself moment by moment and, and for the sake of the of following Christ but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum uh, Brother Camping, I have a question regarding uh, marriage situation now uh, I realize that when you're considering marriage, I think the individual must, one, okay, this might be silly for some people out there, but uh, just as a, a note, um, opposite sex is the main thing. I'm, I've been noticing, like I went to one church, and they're all into this same-sex marriage, so just want to throw that out. That's an abomination to God. But anyway, considering everyone knows that, um, the individual must not have been married before, and if they were married, the spouse should not be alive. Second individual is in a, of an equally yoked background. Third, it should be, of course, mutual interest and love. However, considering all of this, all these uh, particular qualities, uh, if one person isn't in love but simply has a godly love with physical attraction, should they still get married and, and then allow God to create the in-love feeling with the other partner, or should the marriage not be done? Well, if we don't, if we're a child of God, we don't enter into a marriage blindly. We know that uh, uh, the husband is commanded in Ephesians 5, a husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for it. In other words, it isn't uh, maybe at the moment of, of uh, as he's contemplating, should I marry this person who wants to marry me? And other, uh, uh, we certainly are of the same mind spiritually, and she has not been divorced, and I have not been divorced, and so we're qualified to marry each other. And I'm just not that romantically uh, uh, ready for all of this. But the fact is, as I read the Bible, 
that I am to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Can I see that as a command that I will want to obey and I'm going to be praying the Lord before I get married? Oh Lord, can I, can I live with that? Can you, uh, can you, uh, can that develop in my life? And if I'm not ready to love her as Christ loved the church, that is, uh, lay down my life for her so that it'll be the very best for her, then I better not get married. Oh, so just to clarify, so it's not a matter of uh, so much an in love feeling as it is that ability to love as Christ loved the church, which is more of um, being patient, tolerant, kind, um, despite not having that in love feeling. Is that what you're saying? Well, but see, that in love feeling, uh, that that's not finally the the uh, that romance that that romantic feeling. Uh, that sometimes is called almost it almost could be called an infatuation or an erotic feeling that's because you make me feel so good that can go away very quickly once uh, once the honeymoon is over and the rigors of, of face paying the bills and taking care of two babies that have already been born or early on uh, life can get very difficult and uh, all that romantic love is 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 uh, is hardly noticed anymore now am i ready to continue to love my wife as christ loved the church and want the very best for her and uh, and i she is my wife she is somebody i have to look out for and she comes ahead of me when i think about uh, my desires might be and uh, that 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 uh, that is uh, that kind of love is what is going to count in the marriage, not that romantic love that that started out. Okay, that's an excellent answer. And also, considering that answer, uh, and in the light of the church age coming to an end, does it make any sense to marry today? And 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 if you do marry, does it make any sense also to have kids? Considering this world is. Well, you know, we read in, in Jeremiah 29 when Israel was going to go into Babylon, that is the captives, and, and God gave them a command, and I think that that applies to us today. In other words, in, in a real sense, it's business as usual. He says in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 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 Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, to those who were carried away captive, build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. Now you talk about bearing children. Maybe there are some elect that still have to come to existence through this marriage of yours, and you don't know. Leave that with the Lord. That's also excellent. When just one last one, uh, considering yeah, the, the individual decides they do want to get married. Where and who would officiate the whole marriage situation? What would how well, that going? In, in our country, I can't speak for other countries, but. In our country, there are only two things required to have an official marriage. One is you have to have a marriage license, and secondly, you have to have someone who is licensed to marry, marry you. It can be a justice of the peace, a judge, a ship's captain, uh, and so on, That uh, anyone who has the license to marry. Now, if you do get married, you normally we try to have a very spiritual uh, uh, time of it. We, we come together with our friends and we maybe have someone. It doesn't have to be a preacher at all. It can be uh, anybody uh, uh, who is uh, able to speak about the Word of God to, that can, can uh, use this as an opportunity to bring the gospel to those who are assembled. Uh, the re the re reception can be a time of singing spiritual songs, and in other words, uh, the, it doesn't require the church or some elders or deacons or a pastor to make that a very spiritual uh, time uh, when the two are married. 
And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, uh, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, My question is this. When Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was Mary's egg used? Was Mary which? Was Mary's egg used? Oh, well, yes. Well, uh, look, I don't know what goes on in the uh, in the uh, uh, conception process there because this was, the whole thing was an anomaly. It was totally something that has never happened in the history of the world before or since. But we do know that the Father, uh, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the eternal God, effectively took up residence in the womb of, of Mary and that God himself was uh, the holy spirit is spoken of as the father and that the that mary gave god a human nature that uh, no question at all so that he uh, that that he uh, certainly when he was born he must have looked facially uh, somewhat like mary he would have had some of the same characteristics i'm sure Okay, thank you very much. Because he became a real human being, not a pseudo-human being. He became a human being, and uh, and he got that from Mary 100%. There was no uh, no physical father. He had a grandfather, uh, a human, who was be the father of Mary, and so on, because he came from the line of David. But uh, but in so far as his, uh, but as far as his Godhead, no. No, she had nothing to do with it. She was not the mother of God in any sense whatsoever. But shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Harold. James 2, verse 24. James 2, verse 24. There we read, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Okay? Brother Howell, can you compare that with the address of Ephesians 2.8? Well, sure. You see, the uh, uh, in order to be justified, who had to do the work of saving us? Christ. We are saved by the work that he did, by his faith, and his faith is a work. We are justified by the fact that Christ did the work, all the work of saving us, including it was his faith, which is a work that caused us to be saved. Now in Ephesians 2.8, we read, For by grace are ye saved through faith, whose faith? Christ's faith, that is through Christ. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is not of our works, it was altogether of the faith of Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing. And until our next caller, or until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. Family Stations Incorporated has featured Open Forum, a telephone talk program of biblical discussion with host Harold Camping. You're invited to tune in every weekday at this time. All correspondence relating to the Open Forum should be sent to Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. When writing, please indicate the call letters of this station. If you were not able to call in on this broadcast, we invite you to try again on a future open forum. Due to the nature of this type of call-in program, the opinions expressed are those of the participants. Open Forum is a production of Family Stations Incorporated.